Well, hey, Greg, great to have you on the show today. Justin, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, this is fun. You and I got connected through uh, a mutual friend who you know very well uh, in Kasav Aslam. And Kasim is a member of the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. So I've gotten a chance to know him. He's a member of Front Row Dads. Uh, and so we are in a couple of communities where we get a lot of time to hang out and you know have a lot of entrepreneurial type of conversations. And that guy is a million miles a minute with ideas and uh, efficiency and hacks and is just such an impressive guy. So I, I'm appreciative of him recommending you to us. No, that's great. Uh, he's definitely on fire. Uh, we just uh, recently sold his first company for a substantial amount of money. And uh, I think he's a serial entrepreneur with many more deals in him. So it's been a pleasure to know him. I've known him since 2005 when we got to know each other. And we began a little mentorship. He wasn't sure that he needed it or wanted it, but he got it anyways. And uh, I think the results have, have proven themselves quite well. Oh, well, he, he raves about you. And I had the, the privilege of hearing you speak in the Front Row Dads community. And I'm like, we got to we got to showcase Greg, you know, to the world. I want people to know who Greg Smith is. And, you know, you're you're unlike anyone else in your space because your experience spans so much further than most investment bankers, because most investment bankers are, you know, kind of brought in to facilitate a transaction either on the buy side or the sell side. Right. Whereas you actually have experience running companies and you've you've owned the companies that you've actually bought or you've owned the companies that you've actually sold. And so it's a little bit different of an experience when, you know, when you have that type of pedigree. Yeah, it turns out uh, uh, that most investment bankers have not run businesses. And much of my history, Justin, is managing businesses for ultra high net worth families. And because their interests were diversified, uh, I've been involved in quite a few regulated transactions. By regulated, I mean regulated by the federal government. So I've worked on change of controls of applications for financial institutions, maybe some 40 or 50 community banks across the country. Uh, airlines, we had a family get invested in an airline which is an interesting story because I ended up running it, which I didn't plan to do. Uh, chemical companies, real estate, insurance. And, and this has brought about a great deal of depth and understanding the business owner. So when we get involved in an M&A transaction, whether it's sell side, buy side, maybe a recapitalization, we really look at it from the standpoint of the owner, the shareholders, the constituents to the company, and even the employees, their families, vendors, clients, customers, relationships, we try and think about all those things because they're important to, to uh, what's about to happen, whatever it might be. Yeah, your, your background is incredible. I mean, I haven't met like anyone that has run so many different types of companies and, you know, has had some sort of, um, you know, strong investment, whether it be via you directly or via the family office that hired you. Uh, and brought you in as the operator. But uh, I'm curious how you got into this space. Like, what, what was early work life like for you? And how did you become an operator that could run such massive companies and some that have a lot more red tape on them than others because they're regulated? Yeah, the regulation part is an interesting element. And even today, as a registered rep of a FINRA member broker dealer, I'm regulated by the SEC. So, you know, I just <laughs> I just can't seem to get away from it. But thankfully, it's all worked out very, very well with, with me and the regulators of, of all types and all kinds, whether it's the Treasury Department or the FAA or the Department of Energy or whatever it might be. Uh, to answer your question, uh, the short answer would be that coming out of college, I started working in a bank, and it happened to be the predecessor to Wells Fargo Bank here in Minneapolis, which is Norwest Bank. And Norwest Bank ultimately merged with Wells Fargo Bank in 1998, but of course, this was 1972, so that's a long, long time ago. And uh, I started part-time while I was going to school. I graduated, took a position as a credit analyst. It was a two-year training program. They cut it short at about 11 months. All of a sudden, I was a commercial lender in 1972. And in that economy, you really couldn't make a bad loan. Everything was booming in the early 70s and the mid-70s. But I didn't really see my career as a banker. 
uh, and the progression seemed to be a long, long, long journey to ever become a president of a bank. So I uh, vectored to the left and became a CPA. I didn't have an accounting degree. Uh, I did not have a CPA license, but the firm knew I could bring in business as a banker. And so they hired me more on biz dev experience than they did on any accounting credentials, which I subsequently got. And in two years, I was fully licensed and had practiced the minimum amount to have a CPA license left. By the way, we, yeah. super clever of that CPA firm to hire you because that, that's not normal. Not I mean, at all. Major credit to them for the, the having the foresight to recognize what you could bring in by just training you upright and, and utilizing your network. That's that's really cool. Well, yeah, it was a it was a slick move. Uh, and 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 quite frankly, how that came about was I set it up, uh, if you will, uh, as an informational interview. And I'll share this with your listeners because it was uh, really not so much an accident that this happened. I set it up as an informational interview with the partner in charge of the firm. And he was interested because he knew me at the bank and we were in the same building. He was just 12 stories over the bank, which was on the first floor. The CPA firm was up on the 12th floor. And he thought, well, this is kind of curious. I'll take that meeting. It was very impromptu. And he was kind of interested to know what was on my mind. And I just went in to stage an informational interview. What I really wanted was to come and work for the firm, though, again, no accounting credentials, no accounting degree and no CPA license. He made the decision on the spot. I mean, once we walk, walked through everything and I had to make the commitment that I would uh, finish the education and get the license and take the tests and all the rest of it. At the time, it was a two and a half day examination to pass a CPA test. I mean, your, your head explodes just thinking about <laughs> planning for it. Sounds but, rough. Yeah, well, yeah, it was. And of course, no computers, no handheld calculators in the room. It was all paper and pencil. Again, this is uh, 1978, 1979. We didn't have the technology that we have now. So um, there's a chapter in my book, actually, maybe we'll talk about this later, where the gentleman I ended up reporting to um, came in from vacation after two weeks, found me sitting there in the office. And here again, I don't have the academic credentials and the license to 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 that he would expect, and yet I'm I'm hired and the decision is made by the managing partner. It's it was an ugly situation for a couple of years, but I I was there with intent and purpose for a goal and an objective, which then enabled me uh, getting to the answer again to your question, to present myself to several uh, ultra high net worth families and ultimately ended up working with one of them. And I got about 30 years of work done inside of 20, uh, crossing a number of industries and interests and managing their in investments uh, through many, many, many different companies. So what was the first company that the family office brought you into? Was that the chemical company or did they get you in involved in real estate first? I feel uh, like family they... offices often... Like they've got the hacks, they've done a lot of research. They know the game is real estate and private equity, uh, and 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 specifically on the private equity side, that it's likely insurance or outlying businesses with large margins. Yeah, in this case, it was really more about capital and how to leverage capital. So the key investment was community banks. Okay. And at that time, there were almost 13,000 community banks in America. Today, there are fewer than 5,000, I think around 4,700, something like that. So you can see there's been a tremendous roll up. And that's in part because the regulators, they think were like Canada, which at one time had only five charters and uh, could save a few more today. But clearly, the regulators have been shrinking the number of banks, uh, which is fewer banks to regulate for the federal government, as I said, now fewer than 5,000. But the game of, of uh, capital leverage in a bank is simply to uh, make an investment in a bank, a financial institution, which will require capitalization of maybe eight to 10% of assets. And then the other 90 or 92 or 93 or 94 percent of the capital structure is really the deposits of the customers. And so if there was ever uh, an analogy to OPM or other people's money, this is it. It's, it's using yeah. the deposits of the bank and then the leverage and the power of those deposits and the seven or eight or nine percent capital that the investor brings 
to deploy those into assets that are earning two or three or four or 500 basis points more and not mess it up. So uh, you can't make too many mistakes if you're investing in treasury bonds or treasury bills, unless you're on the wrong side of the interest rates or the interest rate yep. curve. Uh, but you can make a great deal of money investing in uh, uh, loans, uh, credits, or alternative assets. And the banks, uh, the banks that the family had at the time were only two or three, but at the end of 20 years, and, and we sold a group of banks that were owned, there were over 114 locations in seven different states. Wow. So and so they, a, they would buy the banks outright then, full ownership? 100% ownership. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And my job was to go out and work with the boards, the owners, the officers, help them through the transition, affect the transaction with the regulators, get the deal closed, and then handle the uh, subsequent conversion into the systems, policies, and procedures of, of the family that, that own those banks. And by the way, what a smart move that you buy these institutions that are, you know, profitable, uh, you've got capital that you need to deploy, um, you can really kind of assess and mitigate uh, the risk because you are in charge, you have 100% ownership. So it's, it's a brilliant strategy. And then for you, from an experience standpoint, you, you experience buying 40 to 50 different banks, and then you actually ran some of them, right? Well, I did. In fact, uh, there was a transaction we did where I was able to get the family 100% approved for a publicly traded bank. So it could have acquired all of the stock. Uh, and the first move was 24.9%. But everybody knew that the family could make a 100% move on the stock. It was publicly traded. And uh, at that juncture, the chairman of the board, who was a, a Goodyear tire salesman in a franchisee decided maybe being the chairman of that bank was not what he ought to be doing. And uh, he asked me to be the chairman. Of course, I asked the family, you know, you all want to be on the board. And they said, nope, uh, <laughs> that's your job. And, uh, and I was out front on almost all these transactions. So yeah, I've had a pretty wide experience. And uh, uh, again, community banking was a real niche area for this family. And, and, and many high net worth families specialize in a particular area that they will more or less stick to. And then occasionally, as their wealth expands, they will do a bit of diversification. You mentioned real estate, and certainly ultra high net worth families are invested in real estate. There's no question about it because of the tax advantages. Uh, but this family also invested in deals that were just basically straight up cash flow deals. So if the multiple was right and there was a growth element that didn't require a lot of capital expenditure and tying up a lot of cash, that was probably going to be the next investment. Oh, I love it. I love cash flow plays. That to me is like, you know, the sweet spot. That's kind of how I got started. And, and once you have enough cash flow, then uh, you really do need to figure out some additional strategies because you can't just have cash flowing assets. But most people, I find, uh, really don't focus on the cash flow and they get themselves involved in all these businesses that may or may not have an exit for 15, 20, 30 years, but they don't have the means today to live the life that they want to live. So I, I love the cash flow angle. Mm -hmm. um, I know banks specifically aren't probably kicking off a crazy amount of cash in the short term, but you've got a lot of capital to invest in things that do kick off cash, right? Right. Uh, in, in terms can, of loans. Yeah. And you can be, you know, as investors goes, you can be asset rich and you can be cash poor. That's right. And it's also a, a matter of evaluating risk and then how much leverage do you want to introduce? And in almost all the deals I've worked on, there's a pretty hefty load of leverage. But we do it on the right side of the interest curve or we lock interest rates or go forward on 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 debt cost um, and then have flexible exits on, on how to move things around as and when we need to. And I'll just and say, another thing, and I'll say another thing about, about uh, families that are established is uh, and I share this with your investors is um, uh, personal guarantees are almost essential for an early stage investor or a oh, young yeah. company. Um, and if it's uh, two or more persons, then you're dealing with what the bank will refer to as joint and several liability. So, you know, you got to pick your partners carefully because if there is downside, 
uh, one or the other may carry all of the risk of repaying the note if the company is unable to pay it either through its cash flow or liquidation of its assets. That personal guarantee is a real liability. And when disclosing a personal financial statement, it's an obligation of a borrower to disclose contingent liabilities. And and people that have established themselves uh, rarely will agree to sign a personal guarantee for the business loan that they're arranging. And the banks come to know those borrowers as established business people who will not default. Now, that isn't always the case, but you know the trend for high net worth people is to avoid uh, personal guarantees and recourse liabilities at all costs because it really hews the balance sheet in terms of the strength of the balance sheet and any contingent liability is marked as a debt, even though it isn't a real debt until it's called on by the banks. And so that can really harm your borrowing uh, capability and your your liquidity capability. Yeah, hey, 100%. We're getting, we're getting into a lot of details here, Justin. I, did, I didn't know I we were going to drive down too far, but if we're down too far, we can come back up a little bit. Oh, this is awesome. This is great content. And I think, I mean, anyone who's not doing a personal financial statement with regularity is um, definitely missing the boat. I mean, I think it's good. There are a lot of people in our community, we talk to, you know, kind of doing it once a month, but at least, at least, you know, a couple times a year, I think it's really smart to, you know, know where you stand. What is your net worth? What are your liabilities? What is your cash flow? Like any any type of statement that you would ever want uh, to figure out if you should invest in a company, uh, you want that for yourself to understand how banks want to invest in you, right? For whenever you need money uh, to be able to start something to buy an asset. So I, I think this is all great content. Yeah, it's essential. And let me add to Justin that not only is that balance sheet important for now and knowing what am I going to do next, but if a if if a business owner or business partners are contemplating an exit, they got to start planning the tax consequences well in advance. Yes. Or they'll just take an absolute shellacking thinking that they're coming out with a certain dollar amount net of the bank debt or whatever the financing might be. And then they find out the tax consequences weren't carefully planned for, which is, it, it's just, I mean, we look at the tax consequences in every transaction that we work on for every client that we have. If we're on the buy side or the sell side, we try and move as much of the tax obligation over to Uncle Sam as we possibly can and make the deal tax efficient. So I would just add that in terms of uh, individual investors looking at their own balance sheet, whether it's highly diversified or not, to look at the tax consequences of, of any exit because li liquidity is great, but there's no free lunch. That's right. Yeah, we talk all the time in, in the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind community about optimizing for taxes, especially when you're about to have an exit and the strategies that can be employed prior to that exit so you can take home more cash. And so, you know, it's funny, we started this episode talking about uh, Cossum's business that you helped him sell. And um, interestingly enough, we've got about 145, 150 members in the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. And we ended up having uh, double digits of them close, uh, like sell their company. Uh, I think it was, um, uh, I think the final number ended up being 23 people sell their company last year uh, after a strong recommendation that the market's probably going to tank and, and it makes sense if you can get a good offer to sell it. And we had so many people, we have people in our community all the time that come in after they've had an exit. And they're always like, oh, I wish I had found you ahead of time because I would have used these strategies to mitigate some of the tax uh, implications that we we're in when we sold our company. Uh, and some people, they do more of like an installment sale. So there's a little bit more time. I'd love to talk to you about, you know, some of the, the tax code uh, impacting a purchase or impacting a sale, uh, pre-tax versus post-tax dollars on an exit, like any of that, I think, uh, from a strategic standpoint, would be really cool to discuss. Sure. And, and we can do that. Um, uh, in a sell-side transaction, if the owner has engaged in an investment banking firm, uh, the investment banking firm will cover all types and kinds of transactions as part of the arrangement for the engagement because the investment banker and the owner of the business really have no idea when they begin the process how this is all going to evolve. 
And if the uh, investment banker is exclusive, meaning he's solely working on this project for some sort of a success fee, he's going to be pulling out, or she, all the stops in terms of exploring what is the highest and best transaction that can evolve for the company. And as I mentioned before, I always take a look at the consequences of the successor employees. Will the jobs be there? Will the factory be closed? Is the building going to be leased off to somebody else? Those are all factors. And this, the owner of the business is driving the bus. But we try and ask all the right questions so there's no surprises. If I bring in an offer and 30% of the workforce is going to be cut, maybe that's not such a great idea for the seller. On the other hand, he may say, if it's the best price, I'll take it. I don't care about the employees. I mean, it does happen. So you have to get all that aired out ahead of beginning a transaction. And then once you start, well, you're kind of out in the marketplace. Now, as to the tax consequences, it really depends on the currency that you're selling your company for. So are you selling your company for all cash at closing? Are you selling your company for stock in another company? Maybe your company will become a division of another company. Uh, maybe you're selling it for cash and stock. Maybe you're carrying the note. Maybe you're selling it with seller financing, or maybe the loans you have in place are now assumed by the buyer. So let me give you an illustration of, of one transaction. As an example, we had a company that uh, went to the market to sell. They were open as to cash or stock. They sold the company, uh, this aggregate of companies, it was a conglomerate of companies, for uh, 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 a negotiated uh, number of shares in a much bigger company. So, Justin, it was a stock-for-stock -stock exchange. The tax consequence of a stock-for-stock -stock exchange, essentially a cashless transaction, is there's no tax. The tax was deferred. Now, the seller exchange his stock for 9 million shares of the buyer's company. And it was a minority interest and the stock was trading at $36 a share. So you can do the math on that. It's probably around $350 million. But there was no tax paid. So <clears throat> the entire value of the transaction was pre-tax. And as it turned out, that stock moved from $36 to $72. And it's just a coincidence wow. that it topped off at exactly 2x the number. Wow. Now, did the family that held those 9 million shares sell at 36 or 38 or 42 or 51 or 72? I'm I guessing not. Well, they, I mean, they, I, I, let's say, I would let's take say, some money off the table for sure. Let's, let's say that they probably <laughs> took some money off the table and, and they would have paid uh, at the then rate, long-term capital gains tax rate, as opposed to ordinary taxes. So, for example, just a sidebar for a moment, if they had taken some of that sale proceeds in the form of compensation on an employment agreement for the next two or three years, let's say a million dollars a year for three years, that would be ordinary income. That's right. At that time, the tax would be almost 2x what it would have been at long-term capital gains rate at that time. But they put all the chips on the table and they said, we're out, you're in, we're now a division of your company and we're leaving the scene and we'll take it all in stock. And it just happened to be that they got a 2x return or as is said in the industry, a double bounce on their investment without a single dollar of tax paid. Now, if they had sold at $72 and actually top picked the market, which rarely anybody can do or should try, by the way. Um, then they would have paid capital gains tax on the delta from their basis, which, of course, was very low. They were founders of the company, so there was practically no basis whatsoever, all the way up to uh, 72. But as things go, Justin, the economy turns and moves, and that's why we have to think about global markets and put things yep. in context because we ran into the subprime market for mortgages in 2008 and that stock is $72 at that time was trading at $8 a share. Oh, my goodness. So did they sell? Did they buy more? We don't know. But we have to take all those things into consideration when we're starting to put a transaction together, particularly a leverage transaction. We have to be very clear in our mind what currencies would we take. 
If somebody needs cash and they need to get it over with and they have a higher and better use for it, they may not mind paying the tax and getting it over with so they have the cash to do the next deal. We work with many serial entrepreneurs who will rarely take equity in somebody else's company because they have no control. Yeah. They'll trade yep. their company out, they'll take the cash, they'll pay the tax, and now they're liquid and they can apply that cash along with leverage to the next deal and the next deal and the next deal. I love it. And and there's, you know, when I look at a strategy like that of of taking capital out, I'd probably dollar cost average out over a period of time uh, for hopefully like a better, a better blended stock rate. But I, I would be really inclined at a double bounce to take the majority of the chips hmm. off the table and just pay the long term capital gains tax. Sure. Um, and and the other interesting thing is what a lot of ultra high net worth families will do is they'll hold on to the stock and instead of selling it, they'll borrow against it. They'll use margin and that way it doesn't cost them anything. Um, you know, there's going to be a lockup period on a transaction like that. So they really probably can't do anything for six months uh, or so, maybe a year. But um, you can borrow against it immediately. Right. Yeah. It's called a reg U or universe. It's called a reg U loan. And depending on the type of loan, a bank can lend 50% or up to 70% against a publicly traded security. So that's basically on margin. And uh, we have a very good friend who's uh, just a wonderful person, an immigrant to the United States from another country and built a very successful business, um, owned it, got capital, private equity, the business expanded. It's in multiple states, not a franchise organization and um, uh, decided to take the company public. And uh, as, it, as it became public, obviously he was diluted as more and more shares were sold, but he still had a very substantial interest in the company and the company was trading at about $20 a share. And so he wanted to support the stock and support the company and support the whole momentum of the growth of the company. And he started doing exactly what you just said. He was borrowing against the uh, stock that he owned, and he owned a lot of it, and he was borrowing 50, 60, 70% against the stock. Incrementally, a little bit at a time, and the stock rolled on up to about $63. And he was borrowed against it. And the stock that he was buying had to be from people that were selling. And as it turned out, his key officers were selling while he was buying. Think about it. He had many officers and many people in the management and middle management and upper management of the company, as it turned out, their transactions had to be disclosed later on, were selling as he was starting to pay $25, $45, $55 for the stock, $65 for the stock. They were exiting. He was buying, but he was doing it on borrowed money. And as it turned out, when he stopped buying the stock, the stock price started to come down. That's right. And, and it came down a lot faster than went up. And the bank started selling out his position. And pretty soon they had sold a substantial part of his portfolio. He maybe had 30% of his holdings left after all the debt was paid off. So margin loans are great. But if you're on the wrong side of the economy, uh, it'll eat your lunch. That's and right. uh, it's interesting how that all evolved. He ended up working for free for the next two years, but for stock options. And today he's worth probably $800 million. And it all has come back to him because he decided to move all of his chips in and say, I'll work for free. Just give me stock options and I'll rebuild the company. And everything wow. worked out fine. But what a ride that was. Can you imagine? No. And, and that's putting a lot of your eggs in one basket, which most entrepreneurs do is they put all their eggs into one basket instead of diversifying. You see a lot of wealth is developed and created, um, you know, really via concentration. But a lot of wealth is maintained over the long haul through diversification. Uh, so it's it's fascinating to hear the stories, see the risk profile. Uh, you don't hear too much about the people that don't make it, which is the majority. Um, but you hear about the the small percentage that do and, and how it worked out. So to me, I'm just, uh, I have a hard time being too concentrated in any certain thing or, or, yeah. you know, ha having anything, even 
you know, if I got chips on the table and they're all in one space, all on a single exit, I feel like I need to diversify immediately. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would add this, Justin, what you what you said makes all the sense in the world. I mean, it's Warren Buffett 101, right? Diversify, yep. be in Coca-Cola, own trains, be in the food business, own industrial buildings. I mean, that is that is a that is a good way to manage your risk. We have also seen uh, those uh, families that were singularly focused in a single industry and happen to get completely wiped out and go into bankruptcy and hit the absolute bottom and be completely insolvent and come back and make fortunes. Wow. I mean, not hundreds of millions, but billions. And wow. the harder they fell, the higher they come back. Not everybody can do that. But going to the bottom doesn't mean you're done. It right. means that you've got a lot to think about. You probably learned a lot along the way of both the ascent and the descent. And now you have a choice to climb back out. And these people that climb back out are, I mean, they should be writing books because those are the greatest lessons in life is how you come back out of a complete wipeout like that. Totally. So I'm really curious, and I think our, our audience would be interested to learn, how do you know when you should bring on an investment banker, uh, you know, and, and, and should you be engaging a top firm? Are there mid, you know, mid-tier firms? And then how do you know when you should not be engaging an investment banker? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't want to be accused of a self promote here. So, um, with, with all my, uh, disqualifiers up front, I am licensed as a registered rep and I, this is not about promoting, uh, investment bankers in any way, but, um, I would say this, um, if a seller is, uh, built a business and is considering his options, he should at least engage in a conversation with an investment banker. And to be practical about it, there are some investment banks that are just too big to take on some companies. They're too small. You have to find the right fit. And there are companies that are too big for an investment banker who may be too small to represent or doesn't have the acumen perhaps to represent that particular type or kind of business. There are investment bankers that specialize in different industries, in different verticals. And it may be that you want to specialize with that type of banker for the representation. I would generally say, and I've said this to all my clients uh, and, and to many others, that uh, a business owner is often going to fail at the task because he has no experience in how to run what we call a competitive process and manage it, uh, which we can do as a third party, though we're engaged by the seller, if it's a sell-side transaction, the uh, conflict with the owner selling his own business is he's got all the bias in the world and he can't be independent to the transaction. And yeah. well, uh, Andy it, has to continue running the business. And, and, you know, if you spend all your time doing it without an investment banker or, or a professional, then that takes away from the business. We've seen it happen time and time again. I don't need a banker. I can do this myself. I'm a sophisticated individual. I know five guys that I shoot birds with. Any one of them would like to have my business. I'm going to sell it to a friend. We've already had that conversation. I met this guy in a pub the other night. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But what inevitably happens is at the most sensitive time for the business to be showing lots and lots and lots of black ink, it doesn't. The margins start to fade. People start to question what's going on. Where's the guy's head at that's running the business? It's not in the business. It's in selling the business. He's having all kinds of clandestine meetings. He's nervous. He's anxious. His mood changes or her, her mood changes. And it's just a really tough spot for everybody, for the owner of the business to start parlaying the business out into the community. I mean, the first transaction I ever did in the M&A business was to sell an operation as a dairy, meaning they had cows and they made cottage cheese. And we sold it to a company in Europe. And this was, this was even before 2000. I mean, this is 19, in the late 1990s. And 
we had to hunt all over the world to find this company that had this particular type and kind of interest in this particular dairy because of its particular products. And we got the absolute best buyer. And this, the seller was shocked. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't imagine that they would be engaged in a conversation like that with this particular company. It, the, the buyer is a name you would know. I mean, they're a big yogurt company all over the world at this juncture, but this was 23 years ago, 24 years ago. So the, if the banker's doing a good job in this digital world, they're all over the place looking for the right buyer. And again, as I said before, it, or started to say, it's not just the price, it's the terms. And many times the terms are going to be more important than the price. Yep. And of course, who is the buyer? What's the outcome? Will my employees have jobs and all the rest of it? Yeah, love it. I mean, so much great uh, insight there. And, you know, whenever I go to buy a business, whether I'm buying the whole company, whether I'm investing in a, a smaller piece of equity in the company, maybe it's a bigger company and I'm just getting a few percentage points. Uh, maybe it's a medium or small size company. I'm buying the whole one, um, the, the, the whole thing. I'm always wanting to have the best due diligence process uh, to evaluate this company, make sure that there's no bias on my end, make sure that um, I've got uh, advisors around me that can speak to me. Uh, I'd love to hear your thought process or any, you know, hacks that you have on the due diligence side. Uh, some of the best advice I got on this was in um, the late 90s from a gentleman that was known to just burn lots and lots and lots of time looking at deals and not buying them. And he would frustrate people like crazy. But he had a family office. He had resources on his team. He had CPAs, accountants, lawyers, people in insurance. So he could assemble a team of people that worked for him and represented his interests. Or he could bring in outside third, third parties if it was Deloitte Touche or Coopers or Ernst CPA firm or whatever resources he would need. But he told me if I was going to be successful in business representing ultra high net worth families, of which he was one, uh, was that you have to look at a lot of deals. That means if you're going to look at a lot of deals, you have to get through it quickly and efficiently and find something that either is going to work or it's got too much risk and you have to move on. And it's very costly and painful to get tied up in somebody else's process who's a seller and you may be a buyer if it's going to drag on and on and on and on and on and momentum and inertia are powerful forces and they can go both ways they can help you and they can hurt you so yeah. uh when we're working with anybody on the buy side uh we try and zero in on exactly what they might be looking for and we do work on buy side transactions investment bankers work on both sides of the transactions but as a buyer, whether you have a team assembled or not, it, it, it takes a lot more than just common sense in terms of evaluating what the seller is showing you, uh, what he didn't show you, uh, what you need to ask for. Uh, we typically work with a pretty standardized list of documents that we have to have before we can even spend any time at all. And if we can't get them uh, or there's a delay in getting them, we just put the deal on hold un until we can get them because we're just not going to waste the time until we have pretty much a full deck of what it is we're looking for. And again, you could probably find checklists like that on the internet, uh, but then it's the skill set in asking those questions, knowing if you're getting a real answer, or you're getting a lot of smoke in the room and it's getting cloudy. Uh, and of course, sellers have rep representatives as well. So they're going to put people up in front of themselves uh, to represent the material, the information, the questions that are being asked and answered. Uh, it's kind of a game back and forth to figure out how this all works. And at the end of the day, uh, you get what you negotiate, Justin. You don't get what's fair. You get what you negotiate. So you better have good resources on both sides, whether you're the buyer or the seller, to know what you're doing and what the results are going to be before you get stuck with it. Oh, this is such great insight. And by the way, I'd love to talk a little bit about your book, uh, No Locked Doors, right? So this is, you're, you're making a statement here in the title of this book. And I know that you discuss, you know, a lot of deals, a lot of strategies, a lot of the things that you've experienced success with, but I'd love to have you share with our audience some of the, uh, the content that's in this book and even why you decided to write it. 
Uh, happy to do that. The book started out as a book of obligation as the resources for the book were given to me by someone I started mentoring uh, in 2005. And having run a lot of companies, I've had the opportunity to mentor quite a few young people coming into various businesses that I've been managing. Uh, this gentleman really didn't come to me as an employee or a resource within a business at all. I was running a bank at the time. And uh, he was introduced to me through a mutual family friend. He was transitioning uh, from one single parent to another single parent. Uh, he was 20 years old, um, had not completed college. Uh, he was uh, unsure about what he wanted to do, but he did not want to work in his father's business. He wanted to find his own way and be his own guy and, and uh, have his own place. But he had never done any of these things. Uh, so uh, this mutual family friend said, maybe you could mentor him a little bit. So we got to know each other. We spent some time with each other. And as the years unfolded, uh, through, uh, uh various uh, fits and trials and successes and failures, he finally was able to land on, on a successful business, uh, platform that he built and developed. Uh, we enabled a few resources along the way to help him. And uh, it turned out that he became very, very successful in his niche area. So he said, you know, Greg, you really should help others um, as you've helped me, but uh, there aren't enough hours in the day. So would you write a book? And I thought, well, I got plenty to do. And I've just spent a pile of time mentoring you. And I have <laughs> got to get back to work and do what I got to do. Uh, and I have no time to write a book. Well, he gave me a beautiful leather book filled with 200 blank pages and a lovely pen. And he said, here you go, just start writing your book. Well, you know, I would take it with me when I was traveling, but I never really got anything put together as a book. So he gave me a gift one day and it was a lovely gift. And it was from a company in Austin, Texas called Scribe Media. And they oh, have yeah. resources all over the world uh, that um, uh, it's kind of like a who's who of some amazing people. And They'll pair you up, and and uh, my mentee gifted me these resources. So it was a gift of obligation because it was paid for. And Scribe uh, partnered me up with some amazing people. And 18 months later, uh, experiencing the journey of writing a book, we came up with a book. And uh, that's the book, No Locked Doors. And No Locked Doors is a book of uh, various experiences I've had with change, challenges in my life mostly business related, some personal related, some family related, but situations where I was approaching something that was getting to be so complex and so difficult that it would have been, uh, I would say, generally easy, though uh, maybe difficult from the shame of failure uh, to walk away. And I learned along the way that when you have a locked door and you are trying to find the key, uh, you have to change your perspective. You have to change how you think. Uh, and you have to change maybe your expectations in terms of what the outcomes might be. I found that you have to look at the light coming through the keyhole. You have to look at the light coming from underneath the door and the frame around it, the ceiling and the floor. And maybe Justin even go around to the other side of the door and look at the light coming in from the other side. And what does that look like? And what's the translucence and the glow of what's coming around the perimeter? And then come back around and ask yourself, are you really ready to walk away from this thing? Or can you really find a way to manage it? And maybe it's about being a better listener. Maybe it's about asking better questions. Uh, maybe it's about being more patient, maybe resetting timetable and resetting expectation. And at the end of each chapter, we evolve a key and we describe and sum up what the chapter was about in two or three pages and really try and isolate the action item that was essential to unlock that door. And these are just simply illustrations in my life, but I think they're illustrations in anybody's life in terms of the challenges that we all face and what are we going to do about it. We have to own our problems. We have to solve our problems and we have to move on. And at the end, we conclude that our journey really becomes our destination. And that's what the book tries to bring about. It isn't about how much money you make or which title you got or which company you got to run or how many hundreds of people reported to you, because no one's going to remember those things. At the end of your life, people are going to know how you touched people, how you 
impacted other people's lives and how did you do it along the way of your life? And and that's the journey. And that's why we say your journey really becomes your destination. It's not about those goals. It's not about the transactions. It's about the relationships. Well, that is beautifully said. And I couldn't agree more with you. And I'm excited for people to learn from you and, and really experience this, uh, this tremendous amount of wisdom that you've stored up over the years from all the experiences that you've had, Greg. Um, where can people learn more about you, learn more about your book? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm pretty easily found there. Uh, the book is at uh, Amazon and most of the other booksellers, Barnes and Nobles and so forth. It's available in a digital paperback and hardcover format. It is a bestseller on Amazon, which shocked me because in in two days uh, it had already sold over 100 copies and was a bestseller in many different categories three different categories i believe so well, it's congratulations it's, it's gone. thank you thank you yeah that's that's a very rewarding feeling to to have the courage to put out and i, I know this because it's nerve-wracking to put something out that's so close to your heart and you're like i hope other people appreciate it uh, as much as I do or appreciate the amount of time and effort and energy that it takes to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just tremendous. If there was one uh, bit of wisdom that you haven't already shared that you'd love to leave our uh, listeners and those watching with, what would it be? Uh, I think it's pretty easy for me to tell you that I think the biggest challenge I have found that people have in their business lives, personal lives, in dealing with uh, the challenges that they have is that they're horrible listeners. I mean, I rarely find a good listener. And I always learn more when I'm listening than when I'm talking. But it's human nature for people to talk and then talk again and talk again. Uh, Dale Carnegie teaches us, I think, in 1934, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that book. if you are just listening and not interrupting and, 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 and not getting in the way of somebody's conversation where they're telling you, that person telling you will start to build trust in you as a listener because there are so few listeners among us in our society. It's just the way it is. It's our human nature to want to talk. But it's our human nature, and we don't think about it, that as we talk more and more, we start to build trust in the person that's listening. So as an investment banker working on merges and acquisitions, we're very keenly interested in listening to what we're going to hear, because we often hear what we need to hear in order to make an informed decision about something that we maybe didn't know about when we started, but because we listened and we maybe asked the right questions, we now know way more than what we knew before. And maybe we need all we need to know, know all we need to know to either move forward or Justin to walk away and maybe in some cases run. But it's being a good listener, I think, is one of the big keys to success. And it's a big, big key to uh, solving problems and unlocking doors. Well, I think that's a profound takeaway and uh, a great reminder to me to continue to work on listening over speaking. Um, so part of why I love being a podcast host is that I get a chance to ask questions and sit here and listen to smart people like you. Uh, and I can be a student every single week, uh, which I love. Uh, and last but not least, I always end each episode with a question to our audience. And that question is simple. Um, this is for those of you watching, those of you listening. What is one step you can take today to move towards financial freedom and, and living a life that's truly on your terms, one that you desire to have? So not a life by default, but rather a life by design. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you next week.